Nathan is a regular office worker by day and a K-drama addict by night, on holidays, and on weekends. He loved watching them, always wishing to experience that kind of love. Though both his parents are Korean, Nathan was born and raised in Canada. When his company transferred him to their branch in Korea, he didn't mind, excited at the chance to attend K-pop concerts of his favorite group anytime he wanted and explore the country. One night, while watching a newly released historical K-drama he was excited about, his laptop suddenly shut off. After checking the socket, he realized the charger wasn't plugged in. As he reached to plug it in, he got electrocuted and passed out. When he regained consciousness, he found himself in a strange yet familiar place, a bustling marketplace with people dressed in traditional clothes. It looked just like the setting of the K-drama he had been watching. Before he could process it, a group of palace soldiers, who seemed to have been chasing him, nearly caught up. Instinctively, Nathan began running, confused about why he was being chased and how he ended up there, but he kept running. He ducked into a nearby shop, where his eyes landed on some traditional women's clothing and jewelry. Deciding to disguise himself, he quickly changed into the outfit. Thanks to watching so many historical K-dramas, he knew how to put it on, even though it was a bit tricky at first. Grabbing an umbrella to hide his face, he walked out, hoping the soldiers wouldn't recognize him. To his relief, they ran right past him, one even apologizing after bumping into him. Realizing his disguise had worked, he dropped the umbrella and began walking around freely. Now, with time to think, he started piecing things together. As he strolled through the streets, he noticed familiar faces and landmarks from the very drama he had been watching before passing out. Was he dreaming after being electrocuted, or had he somehow transported into the drama itself? And why had those men been chasing him, calling him Dong Wu? His thoughts were interrupted when a group of women suddenly approached him. He recognized the eldest as the court lady from the palace in the drama. Instinctively, Nathan blurted out, Court Lady Yoon? The court lady, looking deeply worried, replied, Your Highness, why are you here? You should be having your purifying bath and resting for your wedding ceremony with the crown prince tomorrow. Nathan looked around, baffled, wondering if she was talking to someone else. First, he was a man there was no way he was marrying the crown prince, and second, he knew who the crown prince's bride was, and she looked nothing like him. I'm not her highness, Nathan replied, my name is Nathan, and I have no idea how I ended up here. The court lady gave him a bewildered look before signaling the other maids. Without warning, they grabbed him and began dragging him toward a carriage. The head maid spoke again, I know you're anxious about the wedding but there's no need to run away. You've been preparing for this your whole life. Nathan kept protesting that they had the wrong person, but the maids ignored him and brought him to the palace. They led him into a lavish chamber he immediately recognized as belonging to Her Highness San He, the woman engaged to the crown prince. His eyes widened in disbelief as he muttered to himself, am I in the body of the crown prince's bride? Panicking, he quickly touched his crotch, his dangling pride was still there. He sighed in relief, but confusion flooded his mind. Why did they think he was San He? He rushed to the mirror and stared at his reflection. He looked exactly like her, but as a male version. This was a character he hadn't seen in the drama. Could there be a plot twist involving San He having a long-lost twin? Before he could think further, the court lady announced it was time for the purifying bath and signaled for the other maids to undress him. Alarmed, Nathan stepped back, insisting he could bathe himself. But the maids didn't listen. They kept trying to remove his clothes, as the court lady explained that the purification bath had to be done by them. Despite his struggles, they were much stronger than he was and managed to pin him down, removing his outer garments. As they reached the last layer of clothing that would reveal he was actually a man, Nathan frantically protested, saying he was too shy and only wanted one person to assist him with the bath. The court lady looked puzzled and replied, We always help you with your baths, so why are you shy now? We must ensure you're completely clean for your consummation with the crown prince tomorrow night. Nathan sank to the floor overwhelmed. From watching so many historical K-dramas, he knew that even the smallest mistake could lead to severe punishment, or worse, beheading. If anyone, especially the crown prince, discovered he wasn't actually San He, he was sure he'd lose his head. 
Panic set in as he considered his options, then he remembered Crown Prince Ji Huan's character. Ji Huan was kind, sweet, always smiling, and optimistic despite his poor health. Nathan had instantly liked him when watching the drama. Unlike his younger brother, Jae Won, who was the complete opposite, cold, angry, and without a shred of empathy. Jae Won, the second prince and general, who lead victorious wars and was a master of swordsmanship, archery, horse riding, and anything he set his mind to do. His mere name struck fear in criminals' hearts due to his ruthless, unforgiving nature. Nathan thought that Ji Huan's kindness could be his lifeline. Maybe the crown prince would help him keep the secret until he found a way back to his world. But first, he needed to handle the immediate problem of these maids insisting on bathing him. After protesting for what felt like forever, the head maid finally relented, agreeing to let just one maid assist him with the bath. That maid was Yun Ji, Senhee's personal maid and childhood companion. Nathan recognized her from the drama and remembered that she was gullible. Once everyone had left, leaving just Yunji and him alone with the bath herbs, Nathan headed to the bathroom with her. He quickly came up with a plan. Do you want to play hide and seek? He asked. Yunji's eyes lit up, and she excitedly nodded. Nathan told her to leave the bathroom, close her eyes, and count to 500 while he hid. She hesitated, admitting she could only count to 100. Nathan quickly suggested she count to a hundred five times instead. Giggling, she agreed and left the bathroom, closing the door behind her. With Yunji occupied, Nathan wasted no time. He poured the herbs into the warm bath, quickly washed himself, and changed into the clean clothes nearby. He had never moved so fast in his life, not even when he was late for school or work. By the time Yunji finished her counting and came looking for him, he was already done. Yunji's eyes widened in surprise when she saw the herbs floating in the tub. You already took the bath? She asked. Nathan nodded, assuring her it was all done. She looked unsure. But court lady Yoon told me to help you, she said, her voice wavering. Nathan replied, she won't know if you don't tell. Promise me you'll tell the head maid that you helped me with the bath. She reluctantly promised, then asked if they were no longer playing the hide-and-seek game. Nathan replied he was tired and wanted to rest. Yunji sadly accepted, bowed, and prepared to leave. Before she did, Nathan reminded her to wake him before the court lady came back in the morning to pester him with bathing. As Yunji left, Nathan moved to the bed and jumped on it, as he was tired and couldn't think of anything but to sleep. He hurt his head a little from the jump, as the bed wasn't bouncy, a bit hard but very comfortable. Nathan had barely closed his eyes when Yunji came to wake him up. Still half asleep, he squinted, instinctively reaching for a bedside table to check his phone for the time. It wasn't there, of course, and reality hit him hard he wasn't home. Groggily, he looked at Yunji and asked, What time is it? It's two in the morning, she replied. 2 a.m. Nathan's eyes shot open in disbelief. Why would you wake me so early? Yunji answered, the head maid and the others will be here soon, to dress you for the wedding ceremony, Nathan groaned inwardly. All he wanted was to sleep, but the last thing he wanted was to be forced into another awkward bath situation. He had half hoped that by the time he woke up, he'd be back in his own world, but no such luck. Realizing he had no choice, he dragged himself out of bed and hurried to the bathroom. Yunji had already prepared the bath, and he quickly washed up, all while asking her to keep watch for the court lady. He had just slipped into his inner garments when the head maid arrived. True to her word, Yunji told the head maid that she had bathed her highness, and the head maid seemed satisfied. Nathan barely had time to relax before the real ordeal began. Being dressed for the wedding, it felt like hours as the maids layered clothing upon clothing, applied makeup, and adorned him with heavy jewelry. Nathan was excited for the wedding and forgot he could be beheaded, when his little secret was exposed. Who wouldn't be excited to marry Crown Prince Ji Huan, the man every woman in the kingdom would probably kill to be with? After all, none of this was probably real. Surely, he was still just dreaming after being electrocuted. By the time the sun was up, the maids had finally finished dressing Nathan. Just when he thought they were done, struggling to maintain his balance under the heavy layers of clothing, the court lady added a final touch, a massive, ornate headpiece. Nathan groaned internally and asked, Is this really necessary? 
The court lady nodded, replying, it is. She then looked at him with a hint of suspicion. You've been sounding and acting quite differently since yesterday, your highness. Caught off guard, Nathan quickly faked a cough. I'm just anxious about the wedding. The court lady seemed satisfied, but reminded him to recall all the etiquette she had been taught since childhood. Nathan could only nod. He didn't know the first thing about royal etiquette, but they all thought he was Sanhe, so he had to play along. When they finally arrived at the ceremony, Nathan peeked out of the carriage, scanning the crowd for Ji Huan. His heart skipped a beat when he spotted him. Ji Huan looked even more attractive in person than he had through the screen of his laptop. However, something seemed off. Ji Huan was seated among the audience, dressed more casually than a groom should be, but Nathan brushed it off, thinking maybe this was part of the ceremony. After what felt like an eternity waiting inside the carriage, beads of sweat forming under the layers of fabric, Nathan turned to the court lady. Why am I still in here? Shouldn't the ceremony have started by now? The crown prince hasn't arrived yet, she replied calmly. Confused, Nathan gestured toward Ji Huan. But, isn't the crown prince sitting right there? The court lady's face grew even more concerned. Your Highness, you've been acting strangely since yesterday. Should I summon the royal physician to attend to you before the crown prince arrives? Nathan repeated that the crown prince was sitting right there, and court lady reminded him that J1 was now the crown prince and the one he was getting married to. Nathan's eyes widened in shock as he asked why, she reminded him it was because of his per health. It keeps declining, and so the royal court decided to take the title of crown prince from him as he's not fit to be king and passed it to J1 as he was more fit and more than capable to be king. This wedding ceremony was also to officially announce his new title officially as the crown prince. Nathan sat shocked. The one he was getting married to was actually J1, the ice-cold, heartless prince. He would kill him the moment he finds out he's an imposter with no hesitation. He couldn't go on to marry J1. Without a second thought, he began stripping off the heavy garments and jewelry weighing him down and jumped out of the carriage and sprinted away. He could hear the guards and maids running and shouting after him, but the sound of their footsteps suddenly stopped. He wondered why they stopped going after him, and realized why the moment he bumped his head into someone. Stumbling backward, he looked up, his heart sinking as he met the piercing gaze of none other than J1. The prince stared down at him, his face cold and expressionless. Nathan instinctively reached out as he tripped, hoping J1 would catch him, but the prince didn't move. He simply watched as Nathan fell to the ground indifferent. Yunji and the other maids rushed forward, helping Nathan to his feet. But J1 had already walked away, approaching the king and queen, to bow and apologize for his tardiness. Nathan stood there, stunned. He couldn't run anymore, and even if did, he had nowhere to go after. He was sure, or maybe not, that he would return back home if he got killed, but he didn't want to go through the pain of being beheaded. As the ceremony began, he resigned himself to his fate. During the entire ceremony and exchange of vows, which Nathan repeatedly messed up, J1 kept his cold demeanor, not even wanting to look at him. After the ceremony, with them officially married, it was time for the feast and performances from the entertainers. While everyone was focused on the performers, clapping and smiling, Nathan sat next to his new husband, deep in thought, stealing glances at him. Lost in his thoughts, Nathan suddenly noticed everyone looking at him, clapping and smiling. Confused, he glanced around before the court lady informed him that he had been called to play the zither, as everyone wanted to hear it again after he performed at the last royal banquet. Nathan, having never touched a zither in his life, let alone played one, felt all eyes on him. Reluctantly, he stood and approached the zither, unsure of where to begin. In a moment of panic, he thought to himself that if he was going to get killed soon, then he might as well give a memorable performance. He stood up and in front of the stunned audience, began singing and dancing to That That by P's Y and Suga. Gasps and whispers filled the room, but Nathan pressed on until some maids, sent by the court lady, dragged him away. The queen unimpressed, turned to the court lady and asked if this was the etiquette she had taught the crown princess. Bowing quickly, the court lady apologized, claiming the crown princess had not been feeling well lately. Nathan was dragged to the chamber he would now share with his husband, J1. As soon as they arrived, Nathan collapsed to the floor. 
He thought he might finally be going home, but the smell of food soon woke him up. Without opening his eyes, he followed the aroma and was sitting next to the food in seconds. Yunji informed him that the physician said he had fainted from not eating or drinking anything. Nathan then remembered he hadn't had anything since he arrived, having forgotten amidst all the chaos. Turning to Yunji, he asked why she hadn't reminded him to eat. She explained that the court lady had ordered them not to give him food so he wouldn't look bloated during the ceremony. Nathan replied, So you want me to die instead? Too tired to argue, he began devouring the food like a starving animal, and Yunji quietly excused herself. As he was wolfing down the meal, J1 walked in. Nathan choked the moment he saw him and began coughing uncontrollably. Expecting J1 to rush over with water, Nathan was surprised when he simply stood there, arms crossed, watching him cough. Nathan eventually managed to calm himself with some water and turned to see J1 walking toward the bed. Without thinking, Nathan blurted out, Hey, J1, do you think you're better than everyone just because you're good at everything and attractive? J1 paused, then slowly turned and walked toward Nathan, asking, What did you just call me? Nathan stuttered, J, J, J1. As J1 approached, Nathan began backing away until he hit the wall. J1 moved in closer, so close that Nathan could feel his breath on his face, and pressed his hand against the wall beside him. He stared intensely into Nathan's eyes, his expression unreadable. Nathan felt a bit intimidated, but stared back. After a few seconds of their staring contest, J1 finally spoke. You never dared to look me in the eyes before, Nathan replied, that was before. J1, still gazing at him intensely, continued, you even look and sound different. Sensing where the conversation was going, Nathan quickly faked a cough, directing it right at J1's face, making him back up. Wiping his face, J1 remarked, if you're going to be this noisy, I'll have to throw you out of this room. Nathan mumbled under his breath, do you think I even want to be in this room with you? J1 ignored him and sat in the corner of the room, reading a book, while Nathan continued eating, intentionally chewing loudly to annoy him. But J1 remained unbothered, completely ignoring him. When night fell, the court lady and Yunji entered the chamber, bringing in a table full of liquor and placing it in the middle of the room. Nathan, confused, asked what it was, but they simply smiled and left without a word. Approaching the table, Nathan discovered it was liquor and said, but I don't drink. Without a word, J1 stood up and downed all the liquor in one go. Then, with a swift motion of his sword, he slashed through the air, extinguishing all the candles, plunging the room into darkness. Startled, Nathan immediately jumped onto J1, clinging to him tightly, begging him to relight the candles. He had always been afraid of the dark and needed light to sleep. J1 pried Nathan off and threw him onto the bed before returning to his corner, leaning his head against the wall with his arms and legs crossed, closing his eyes to sleep. Nathan quickly got up and rushed back to J1, hugging his arm tightly. J1 once again pulled Nathan off him and went to lay down in the bed. Nathan immediately followed again, lying next to him. As J1 tried to get up again, Nathan grabbed his clothes, pulling him back and hugging him tightly. J1 flipped Nathan over, pinning him to the bed, now on top of him. Is this your way of getting me to consummate the marriage with you? J1 asked, his voice low. Taken aback, Nathan instinctively shoved J1 so hard that he fell off the bed, landing on the floor with a thud. J1 shot him a glare, while Nathan quickly apologized, stammering that he didn't mean to push him so hard. He explained he was just afraid of the dark. J1 stood up, letting out a heavy, disbelieving sigh, before lighting a few candles by the bed. He then retreated to his corner again, leaving Nathan to finally relax. Glancing over at J1, Nathan couldn't help but think that maybe there was some niceness in him after all. The next morning, Nathan woke up to find J1 still in the same corner, asleep in the same position. Curiosity got the better of him, and he slowly approached, wondering how anyone could sleep like that. As he reached out, finger poised to poke J1's cheek, J1's hand suddenly shot up, grabbing his finger and snapping his eyes open. Startled, Nathan tripped, thinking J1 would catch him, but just as quickly, J1 let go, and Nathan hit the floor hard. J1, with a raised brow, asked, were you trying to take advantage of me? Nathan, wincing in pain from the fall, retorted, 
who could possibly take advantage of you? At that moment, Jay Wan unsheathed his sword, and Nathan's eyes widened in fear. He backed away hastily explaining that he wasn't trying to do anything. But Jay Wan ignored him, walking past to the bed. Without a word, he cut his palm and let his blood drip onto the sheets. Nathan asked, What's that for? Jay Wan replied, To make everyone believe we consummated the marriage. Just then, court lady and Yoon Ji announced their presence and walked in. They told Nathan it was time for his bath. Nathan quickly moved to Jay Wan's side, wrapping his arms around his neck and saying, I'll be taking my bath with Jay Wan from now on. The court lady immediately signaled for him to refer to Jay Wan as Your Highness, but Nathan ignored her. Jay Wan, unbothered, simply instructed them to change the beddings and leave. They smiled at the sight of the blood on the sheets before leaving the two alone again. As soon as they were gone, Jay Wan began taking off his clothes. Startled, Nathan asked, What are you doing? Undressing to take a bath with you, Jay Wan replied, panicking. Nathan quickly stopped him, grabbing his hand and explaining, I didn't mean it. I was just trying to get them to stop insisting on bathing me. Jay Wan glanced down at Nathan's hand on his and asked, Are you trying to seduce me now? Nathan immediately released his grip, giving Jay Wan a slight push in the process. Jay Wan calmly put his clothes back on and left without another word. Finally, Nathan was alone. He headed to the bath, sinking into the warm water with a sense of relief. For once, he could enjoy a bath without anyone trying to help him. As he soaked, his mind wandered to the performance he'd given at the feast. He couldn't shake the worry that the song he sang, his favorite, might cease to exist in his own timeline because he'd sung it here. After finishing his bath and dressing in fresh clothes, Nathan sat on the bed, staring into the empty room. There was nothing to do. No phone, no TV, no laptop, no friends, and certainly no karaoke bars. He wondered how he was going to survive here, and more importantly, when this dream would finally end. Nathan decided to take a tour around the palace to pass the time, with Yunji following him everywhere he went. During his walk, he ran into Ji Huan, who greeted him with a bright smile and asked how he was doing. Nathan, concerned, noticed how pale Ji Huan looked, as if he might collapse at any moment. Despite having lost his title as crown prince, Ji Huan still smiled. Nathan gently held him and offered to walk him to his chamber, which Ji Huan accepted with a grateful nod. As they walked, they made casual conversation, and when they reached Ji Huan's chambers, Nathan's eyes were drawn to the beautiful calligraphy adorning the walls. Ji Huan noticed his admiration and offered to teach him the art of calligraphy whenever Nathan. Nathan excitedly agreed but suggested they do it another time since Ji Huan looked too weak at the moment. After bidding farewell, Nathan found himself once again with nothing to do. Bored, he wandered aimlessly around the palace until an idea struck him. Gathering some guards, maids, the court lady, and Yun Ji, he decided to teach them English. At first, they were reluctant, worried it would be considered slacking off from their duties, which was punishable. The court lady even questioned how he knew the language of foreigners. Nathan lied, saying he had been secretly studying it, and then coaxed them into agreeing to his English lessons, which he dubbed English 101. He started by telling them that the most important part of learning a new language was understanding curse words. The group immediately protested, saying they weren't allowed to curse. Nathan quickly clarified, grinning, that it wasn't the type of curse they were thinking of, it was the good kind. He began by teaching them how to say, fuck you demonstrating with a middle finger. When they asked what it meant, he explained that it was a polite way of thanking someone who didn't deserve it. He made them repeat after him till they got it. Nathan went on to teach them every curse word he knew in English. They all scattered the moment they saw J1 approaching. Nathan turned around and saw why they all suddenly left. J1 glanced at him briefly before heading toward their chamber. Nathan stepped in his path and asked, is that how you greet your wife after coming back from work? J1 continued walking slowly toward him, and Nathan backed away until his back hit the door of their chamber. How do you want me to greet you? J1 asked. Nathan replied, maybe a hi, I'm back would do. J1 responded, you can see that I'm back. Why do I need to announce it again? As Nathan found himself pinned against the door, J1 was just an inch away from him. Suddenly, the door opened, and Nathan began to fall. He didn't bother reaching out for J1, knowing he enjoyed watching him fall. 
But unexpectedly, J1 caught him, pulling him back. J1 pulled Nathan a bit too hard, causing their lips to meet. Nathan's eyes widened in shock, and he froze, his lips still pressed against J1's. J1, however, remained unfazed, his usual calm demeanor intact as he waited for Nathan to pull away. Once Nathan snapped out of his shock, he quickly stepped back, stammering, It's not my fault. You pulled me. J1 entered the chamber with his usual nonchalance, but touched his lips subtly once. Nathan wasn't looking. In the following days, Nathan kept busy by learning calligraphy from Ji Huan and holding his English 101 lessons for the workers in his quarters. Despite the court lady's warnings that as the crown prince's wife, he shouldn't frequently visit other men's chambers, Nathan ignored her. She always caught him sneaking away and stopped him. With the workers' limited availability, Nathan found less time to conduct his English lessons. J1 was rarely home, often returning late at night or not at all. Nathan spent his time eating, staring at himself in the mirror, and lamenting his lost life. He missed his phone, watching K-dramas on his laptop, attending concerts, and even his work, which he had once hated. Nathan found himself crying, and just then, J1 walked in. He approached silently and offered his handkerchief. Instead of taking it, Nathan grabbed J1's hand and hugged him, wailing, I want to go home. J1 wanted to embrace him but restrained himself, allowing Nathan to cling to him until his crying subsided. J1 had been on the hunt for a notorious criminal named Dong Wu the leader of a group known for attacking people, stealing goods. Dong Wu was a master swordsman, nearly as skilled as J1 himself. His face was never seen, as he always wore a mask, and he was feared by both locals and foreigners. Each time J1 nearly caught him, Dong Wu managed to escape. Although J1 had captured some of Dong Wu's followers, they refused to reveal his location or appearance. Fortunately, a merchant who had once seen Dong Wu's face during a robbery, agreed to describe him for a portrait. The portrait was finally ready and given to J1. He stared at it in shock and confusion. It was San He, but a male version. No matter how much he examined it, the resemblance was striking. He recalled how San He had changed suddenly and started acting like a completely different person. With growing suspicion, he took the portrait back home. Upon arriving at the chambers, he found Nathan sleeping. J1 drew his sword and held it to Nathan's neck, but Nathan didn't flinch. He simply turned to a new sleeping position and snored. Was he pretending or was he really San He and they just happened to look alike? J1 sat in the corner of the room, scrutinizing Nathan as he slept. Nathan stirred awake briefly and saw J1 intensely staring at him. Startled, Nathan jumped up and exclaimed in English, Oh shit, you fucking scared me. J1 didn't understand and was just focused on questioning Nathan. He moved closer and climbed on top of him, bringing his face near Nathan's. Nathan held his breath and stuttered, What are you doing? J1 didn't respond, keeping his lips almost touching Nathan's. Nathan shut his eyes tightly, heart racing, then felt J1 get off him. He tried to move, but realized his hands were tied to the bed with rope. Desperate, he tried to untie the rope but couldn't. He asked J1 why he was tied up, and J1 revealed Dong Wu's portrait. Nathan saw the resemblance to himself and realized J1 had discovered his true identity. Before J1 could start interrogating him, Nathan confessed, I didn't mean to pretend to be San He. I was dragged here even though I told them I wasn't her. I stayed because I had nowhere else to go and didn't know I'd last this long. I'm still trying to figure out how to get back home. J1 replied, Dong Wu, I finally found you. You did well hiding right under my nose. There's no escaping now. Where did you hide the real San He? Nathan responded that he didn't know where she was either and wanted to find her, hoping she might be his ticket back. J1 said, Maybe you'll talk once the torturing begins. Nathan's eyes widened as he continued to protest. I really don't know where she is. Listen, I'm not even the real Dong Wu you've been searching for. My name is Nathan from the future, and I somehow ended up in this body. J1, unfazed, retorted, I heard you prefer speaking with your sword, but I didn't know you were this talkative and a coward. Or are you just pretending? Nathan pleaded, That's because I'm not really Dong Wu. I'm not even from here. Please believe me. J1, however, dismissed his pleas and called for guards to arrest Nathan. 
He instructed them to do it quietly and not to alert anyone for now. As Nathan was dragged away, he clung to J1's leg, wailing, I don't want to go to jail and get tortured. J1 shook him off, and the guards continued dragging him. Nathan's cries echoed as he was thrown into a cell, which housed a group of giant looking men. His wailing grew louder, begging to be let out. To his surprise, the men bowed to him and addressed him as master. Nathan stopped wailing, confused, and asked why they were calling him that. They told him a story about how they became his followers, and asked if he was pretending to have lost his memory. Nathan denied being their master and resumed wailing, exclaiming, Why did I have to end up in the body of a criminal? I can't do this anymore. I want to go back home. As lightning struck outside, Nathan wondered if it was a sign. Meanwhile, as J1 lay in bed, trying to fall asleep, Memories of Nathan's cheerful smile, silly acts and some of their moments together played in his mind. He abruptly sat up and went out to practice archery. Back in the cell, Nathan soon forgot about his predicament, finding comfort with his new followers. He laughed and chatted with them, asking if he was related to Sanhi. They assured him that they had investigated and found no relation, merely a striking resemblance. Nathan eyed them suspiciously questioning if they had kidnapped Sanhi. The men quickly denied. Nathan began to wonder where Sanhi could be. The next morning, the guards entered the cell with a whip, calling out for Nathan. Terrified by the sight of the whip, Nathan started running in circles, with his followers trying to shield him. The chaos continued until J1 arrived, asking the guards to leave Nathan alone. Nathan, seizing the opportunity, ran to J1 and clung to him tightly, insisting that he didn't know where San he was and that he wasn't Dong Wu. Despite J1's attempts to push him away, Nathan didn't let go. J1 managed to get Nathan off him and asked the guards to release him. Nathan, relieved, thanked J1 for believing him. However, J1 clarified that he didn't believe Nathan's claims. Instead, he intended for Nathan to continue acting as the crown princess until the real one was found. And he will help in finding her because he's the only one who probably knows where she is. Nathan sighed, frustrated, but didn't argue that he really didn't know where she was. At least they were letting him out. Back in the chambers, Nathan eagerly jumped on the bed and requested a table of food, devouring it as if he hadn't eaten in years. After his meal, he took a long, refreshing bath and went outside to breathe fresh air. Night, as Nathan tried to lay down on the bed, J1 kicked him off, declaring that he would now sleep on the floor. Nathan rolled his eyes and asked for at least a mat, a cover, and a pillow. J1 replied there were none available and closed his eyes to sleep. Nathan complained, how am I supposed to sleep on the floor with nothing? Do you know how cold it is? J1 ignored him and kept his eyes shut. Nathan mumbled to himself, at least he didn't turn off the candles, he settled in the corner where J1 used to sleep. As the night progressed, the cold became unbearable, and Nathan started shivering. He could feel the cold and his legs numb even though he was in deep sleep. The next morning, he woke up, finding himself in the bed. He sat up and saw J1, then asked if he carried him to the bed. J1 didn't reply, and Nathan smiled saying, I knew you had a soft spot for me. Jay looked at him and asked him to get ready. He was going to lead them to the mountains where he lived with his followers. San he might probably be hidden there. Nathan told him he didn't know where that where that was but Jay one wasn't listening. They headed out and Nathan kept reminding him he really didn't know where the place was. As they journeyed through the woods and climbed hills, Nathan reminisced about how he used to dislike hiking, now finding himself forced into it. The trek was interrupted when a group of masked men attacked, targeting J1. J1, agile and skilled, engaged in a fierce sword fight. Nathan, terrified, looked for a place to hide. Suddenly, an arrow flew through the air. J1 managed to dodge it, but it struck Nathan in the thigh. The pain was intense, even if he was dreaming. The masked men, now injured, fled. J1 ran to Nathan, looking worried, but tried to look calm, like a pro. He managed to quickly remove the arrow and bandage Nathan's wound with a piece of his cloth. J1 scolded Nathan, asking why he stood there and not dodged the arrow when he had sharp senses. Nathan, tears in his eyes, replied, I told you I'm not Dong Wu. J1 sighed heavily. Unable to stand, Nathan was swiftly picked up by J1, who carried him to a waiting horse. Nathan, 
resting his head on Jae Won's shoulder, forgot about the pain and smiled contentedly. Jae Won looked like he knew who the assassins were. They walked a few steps before reaching the horse. Jae Won put Nathan on it, and then climbed up himself. Nathan asked if he was stealing someone's horse, and Jae Won replied that it was his. Nathan, still in disbelief, asked, You had a horse this whole time and made us walk? Jae Won smirked and got the horse to start moving, making it go slowly because of Nathan's injury. Nathan, still in disbelief, asked, Is that a smirk? Jae Won rode them home on the horse in silence. When they got back, Jae Won had the royal physician properly check Nathan's wound. In the following days, Jae Won stayed home to take care of Nathan, though he never admitted that. Nathan became a nuisance, lying in bed and ordering Jae Won around, even though he could have asked Yoon Ji. Jae Won didn't complain and did everything Nathan asked. Nathan pretended to still be in pain even after he had recovered, until Jae Won caught him walking normally. When Nathan tried to keep up the pretense, Jae Won unsheathed his sword and asked, do you want me to completely cut your leg off? Nathan laughed nervously and started jumping, saying, Oh wow, my leg is ten times stronger after healing. In the days that followed, Jae Won focused on searching for San Hee without Nathan. Nathan felt a pang of jealousy. Why was he feeling jealous? A person's life was at stake. But why was Jae Won so worried looking for her? Was he in love with her? One day, when Jae Won returned from a search, Nathan walked up to him, put his face close, and asked, Are you in love with Sun Hee? All Jae Won could focus on was Nathan's face close to his. He felt his heart racing and his face growing warm. He quickly rushed out without replying, and breathed out, fanning his face, wondering why he felt so hot when it was breezy outside. Nathan was wandering aimlessly around the palace when he bumped into Ji Hwan. Ji Hwan noted that Nathan hadn't been attending their calligraphy lessons. Nathan had completely forgotten and replied that he had been busy. He added that he was free now and they could do it then. They walked to Ji Hwan's chamber, and Nathan noticed that Ji Hwan looked healthier than the last time he saw him, which made him glad. Meanwhile, Ji Hwan had returned home and couldn't find Nathan. He asked Yoon Ji where Nathan was, and she told him he was in Prince Ji Hwan's chamber. Ji Hwan's expression turned to annoyance as he headed there. He barged in and saw Nathan in close proximity to Ji Hwan. Jae Won pulled Nathan away by the wrist and started to leave when Ji Hwan remarked, Won't you even greet your elder brother? Ji Hwan had a sweet smile on his face, but Jae Won looked ready to fight. He didn't reply and walked out with Nathan. Jae Won let go of Nathan's wrist and headed to their own chamber. Nathan followed closely, asking why Jae Won was angry. When they reached their chamber, Jae Won turned to Nathan and asked what he was doing alone with Ji Hwan, and why he was sitting so close to him. Nathan replied that he was just learning calligraphy from Ji Hwan. Jae Won asked, Why do you want to learn calligraphy? Even if you wanted to, you could ask me. I'm good at it too. Nathan squinted his eyes in suspicion and smiled widely. Are you jealous? Jae Won laughed awkwardly. Don't be ridiculous. Why would I be jealous? This was the first time Nathan saw Jae Won laugh. Nathan moved closer, his face just an inch away from Jae Won's, and asked, Are you sure you're not falling in love with me? Jae Won felt his heart race and his face grow warm. He just stared at Nathan, starstruck. Nathan touched his cheeks asking why his face was turning red. With that touch, Jae Won felt something run through his body. He quickly rushed out and ran a few laps around the horse racetrack. Afterward, he took a cold bath in a spare bathroom, which was also his. He waited until very late at night, hoping Nathan was asleep by then. He tiptoed in slowly and carefully shut the door, only to find Nathan right in front of him. Startled, J1 asked why Nathan was still awake. Nathan replied that he was waiting for J1 so they could sleep together. J1's eyes widened. What? Nathan chuckled. It's not what you're thinking. We're just sleeping. J1 tried to leave but Nathan stopped him, pulling him to the bed. He made Jae Won lie down and then cuddled up close, hugging him tightly. It was so tight, Jae Won couldn't move and eventually gave up. They both drifted off to sleep. The next morning, Jae Won opened his eyes to find Nathan staring at him with a smile, his fingers resting under his chin in a fist. As soon as Jae Won's eyes opened, Nathan said, Good morning, Jae Won-y. Jae Won asked, What did you just call me? Nathan repeated, Jae Won-y. 
Jay Won made a disgusted face and asked him not to call him that again. Nathan ignored him and kept saying, Jay Wonny, Jay Wonny, Jay Wonny. Jay Won quickly got out of bed, covering his ears and running around the room with Nathan chasing him. He then ran out, and Nathan watched him leave chuckling. In the following days, Nathan was all over J1, acting flirtatiously and continuously calling him j one J1 was even scared to return home, but did so to avoid gossip. Even when he wasn't at home, Nathan seemed to be everywhere, calling him j one His heart raced every time he was with Nathan, and he felt a strange sensation in his body. He visited the royal physician to check if he was ill, but the physician confirmed he was perfectly fine. One day, while Nathan was flirting, J1 told him that he would take him back to prison if he didn't stop. Nathan didn't take him seriously and flirtatiously poked his shoulder, batting his eyes and saying, Will you really do that? I know deep down you believe what I said about not really being Dong Wu. J1 said, Stop doing that. Nathan asked, Doing what? J1 replied, Batting your eyes like that. Suddenly, Nathan winced in pain, holding his thigh where he had the arrow injury. J1 quickly bent down to check, worried. As he was bending, Nathan kissed his cheek. J1 stood there, holding his cheek and looking frozen. He quietly walked to the bed, still holding his cheek, and lay down. Nathan followed, cuddling up to him, and J1 didn't try to resist. Nathan decided to make J1 jealous by spending more time with Ji Huan. Whenever the brothers crossed paths, the tension between them was palpable. Curious, Nathan had asked Yoon Ji about their relationship, and she explained that they had been inseparable when they were younger, but things changed when they became teenagers. Nathan couldn't help but wonder what had come between them. His plan to make J1 jealous worked effortlessly. Every time J1 saw Nathan with Ji Huan, he looked ready to start a war and would immediately pull Nathan away. One day, as J1 quietly read in the chamber, Nathan approached him with a smile. He leaned in close and asked, What are you doing? J1 stared at him, suddenly feeling like he couldn't breathe. In a low voice, he asked, What are you doing to me? Nathan replied, What am I doing? J1 swallowed hard, his eyes fixated on Nathan's lips. Slowly, he leaned in, and Nathan did the same. Their lips met in a gentle, passionate kiss. The gentle pressure of their lips sent shivers down his spine as they lost themselves in the intimacy of the moment. When they pulled away, locking eyes, J1 said, This is wrong. Nathan asked, What's wrong? J1 replied, Everything. I shouldn't be feeling this way. We're both men. Nathan responded, Where I'm from, it's pretty common to see two men in love and in a relationship. J1 scoffed slightly, What kind of fantasy world do you think you come from? Nathan smiled and said, Just follow your heart. Don't think about anything else. He leaned in again for a kiss, and though J1 hesitated, he eventually leaned in too. There, their lips pressed against each other in a tender, soul-stirring kiss. The kiss was gentle, but they could feel their longing for each other. After the kiss, Nathan hugged J1, placing his hand on J1's chest and asking, What is your heart telling you? J1 replied, That I'm insane. Nathan cupped J1's face gently and confessed, I think I'm in love with you. J1 blurted out, me too, but immediately stood up, looking conflicted. But I shouldn't, I still have to put you in prison, he said. Nathan asked, is that all you're thinking about? J1 flustered, replied, I can't think properly anymore. Nathan asked, will you regret not following your heart if you wake up one day and I'm gone? J1 fell silent. Slowly, he moved closer to Nathan, embracing him, resting his forehead on Nathan's shoulder. Nathan hugged him back, saying, You don't have to force yourself to accept your feelings for me. Back home, not every guy I liked liked me back. Some did, but they were scared to admit it. J1 looked at Nathan, jealousy clear on his face. You've liked other people? How many? Nathan teased, Are you jealous? J1 pressed, How many? Nathan started counting on his fingers, pretending to think before answering that he'd lost count. J1 nodded, his jealousy increasing. Nathan continued, but you're my first kiss, so you have to take responsibility. A smile crept onto J1's face, which he tried to hide but couldn't. Amused, Nathan asked, is that a smile? J1 pulled Nathan into his arms, ready to follow his heart and not think of anything else. 
In the days that followed, the two were inseparable, showing PDA everywhere without caring who was around. The palace staff was shocked to see the couple, who used to bicker constantly, now so in love. They went on dates to the market and attended festivals together, because Nathan said he hadn't had a chance to explore since arriving. J1 spoiled Nathan with gifts, giving him everything he asked for, and even things he didn't ask for, just because Nathan glanced at them. Nathan told J1 stories about where he was from and taught him English words and phrases, like I love you and making him call him Pookie. J1 always played along and even asked what he looked like back home. Nathan replied, I'm way cuter and more attractive than this face, you wouldn't be able to take your eyes off me. J1 just chuckled. Nathan even had him draw a portrait based on his description. J1 was like a different person now not cold or stern anymore, at least not with Nathan. He had become a total simp for Nathan. One day, as they lay cuddling, Nathan asked, So what will happen to us if we find Sanghee? J1 brushed off the question, saying they should just enjoy the moment and not think about the future. He had thought about it too, but had no answer himself. J1 was summoned to the royal court, where Ji Huan was also present. Ji Huan had requested a duel between him and J1, with the last man standing to be declared the next king. Ji Huan had secretly been using illegal drugs smuggled from another country to cure himself and make himself stronger. He had multiple physicians examine him to prove he was no longer the sickly person he used to be. J1 had no desire to fight, but the king and court officials had already agreed, and the duel date was set. He and Ji Huan used to be close when they were kids. For some time, he always got punished for things he didn't do and had no idea about. His only comfort had been Ji Huan, until he discovered it was Ji Huan who had been framing him all along. From then on, Ji Huan made it clear he hated him. Ji Huan believed Ji Huan always stole what was rightfully his and liked the same things he liked. No matter how good or obedient Ji Huan was, everyone still preferred Ji Huan. That resentment grew over the years, turning into hatred with Ji Huan constantly trying to ruin J Wan's life or even get him killed. It all escalated when the title of Crown Prince was taken from him. While Ji Huan kept up the facet of being kind and sweet, J Wan knew who he really was. The day before the duel, Ji Huan approached Nathan and handed him some honey cookies to give to J Wan, saying he had bought them at the market without thinking, because he remembered they were J Wan's favorite. Nathan, curious, asked why Ji Huan wouldn't give them to J Wan himself and Ji Huan explained that J1 wouldn't accept them if they came directly from him. Feeling a bit sorry for Ji Huan's attempt to mend his relationship with his brother, Nathan took the honey cookies without much thought and promised to pass them on. When J1 returned home, Nathan gave him the cookies, and J1 ate them without hesitation, because it was from Nathan. But when Nathan mentioned they were from Ji Huan, J1 immediately stopped threw the rest away, and asked Nathan to stay away from Ji Huan as much as possible. Nathan teased, Why, are you jealous? But Ji Huan was serious, telling him that Ji Huan wasn't the person he pretended to be. On the day of the duel, a large crowd gathered, including many commoners, most of whom placed their bets on Ji Huan. Before the match, Nathan hugged Ji Huan for a long time, asking him to return safely. Ji Huan promised he would. As he started walking away, J1 suddenly came back and gave Nathan a kiss on the lips. He took a few steps again, only to return for another kiss, saying the first wasn't enough. He repeated this several more times until Nathan told him that was enough and urged him to go, even though he enjoyed it. J1 smiled and asked Nathan to sit somewhere where he could see his face the whole time, and Nathan nodded. The fight began as expected, with J1 in the lead, though Ji Huan exceeded everyone's expectations by holding on well. When Ji Huan sensed he was about to be defeated, he leaned close to J1 and whispered in his ear, What do you think will happen when everyone finds out your wife is actually a man and the criminal everyone despises? J Huan's guard dropped for a brief moment, and Ji Huan seized the opportunity, giving a hard hit that sent J1 to the ground. When J1 tried to rise, he found that he couldn't move. He couldn't feel his legs or any part of his body. He reached for his sword but was unable to grip it. Then, a sharp pain shot through his stomach, and he vomited a thick, black blood. Nathan rushed to his side, his heart sinking in fear when he saw the blood. Ji Huan, pretending to be concerned, called out for help, 
But Nathan noticed a fleeting smirk cross Ji Huan's face. The realization hit him. Ji Huan had poisoned the cookies with a slow but deadly poison, one that left no trace after death and no one could survive once ingested. Nathan couldn't bring himself to confront Ji Huan. He was too devastated, cradling J1's Wan's head in his lap, desperately tapping his cheeks to keep him awake. J1 struggled and lifted his hand to cup Nathan's face, gently wiping away his tears. He knew it was his end. Pulling Nathan closer, he kissed him softly and asked, forcing a weak smile, tell me again what it's like where you come from. Nathan, choking back sobs, replied, this isn't the time for that. I'll tell you when you get better, so don't close your eyes, don't sleep. J1 said, if your world truly exists, let's meet again there. With those words, his hand fell, and he lay still, waiting for his final breath. Suddenly, Nathan felt a sharp pain in his stomach and vomited dark blood as well. He remembered he had eaten some of the cookies before giving them to J1. Instead of fear, a gentle smile spread across his face as he looked at J1 and said, let's meet in my world. He collapsed beside him, their eyes meeting one last time. With tears falling, J1, in his final moments, watched his lover pass, not able to do anything. Ji Huan was shattered, seeing Nathan lying there, realizing he had fallen in love with him, even after discovering his true identity. Nathan slowly opened his eyes to find himself in a hospital bed. He had apparently been in a coma for a year. The moment he woke up, his parents, who were by his side, quickly called for the doctors. Nathan just lay there, unmoving, as tears streamed down his face. He didn't think everything he went through was just a dream, and believed he would meet J1 again. A few days later, Nathan was discharged and returned home. First thing he did was to check his laptop for the drama and discovered that the K-drama he had traveled into while watching didn't exist. Nothing felt the same anymore not even the thought of watching K-dramas, his once favorite pastime. He didn't feel like working either, but he had to because life went on and he needed to make a living. Fortunately, his company had held his position, waiting for his return. One day, while helping his parents shop at the mall, Nathan spotted someone who looked just like Sinhi. He mumbled her name to himself and out of curiosity, approached her. Are you Sinhi? Her expression gave her away, but she quickly replied, you've got the wrong person, and walked away. However, unable to resist, she returned and asked, how do you know my real name? Nathan's eyes lit up as he asked, so you are really Sanhi, the one who was engaged to the crown prince but disappeared before the wedding? How do you know all of this? She asked. Nathan was about to explain everything when his parents called for him, forcing him to leave. They exchanged contact information and agreed to meet again. Seeing San, he reignited Nathan's hope that he might see J1 again. When they met again, Nathan told her everything, all that had happened there. San, he also told him how she ended up in the modern world. She just passed out from continuous stress, and when she woke up, found herself in a strange place. She was scared at first, but soon adjusted, and was happy. She could finally be herself and live freely. One day, as Nathan got off the bus from work, his eyes caught sight of someone in the crowd who looked like J1. His heart skipped a beat, and without thinking, he rushed toward the figure, weaving through the sea of people. But as he reached the person, his excitement faded. It wasn't him. Apologizing, Nathan turned away. He walked slowly, eyes on the ground, lost in thought, when he accidentally bumped into someone. Sorry, Nathan began to say, but his words caught in his throat as he looked up, and his eyes widened in disbelief. He stepped back, staring at him in disbelief as tears already filled his eyes. While stepping back, he stumbled and was about to fall, but J1 caught him before he could. Nathan touched his face and asked with a breaking voice, J1? J1 smiled warmly. I prefer j one -y, he teased. The tears in Nathan's eyes began to fall as he hugged J1 tightly and said, I thought I wouldn't see you again. J1 hugged him back and replied, I knew I would. They felt people passing by staring at them, so J1 said, let's go to my place. Nathan asked in surprise, your place? J1 nodded, took his hand, and led him to his car. Nathan was surprised to see he had a car and could drive. When they arrived at J1's house, Nathan was amazed by its size. He asked, whose house is this? J1 replied, ours. 
I found some gold bars in my pocket when I arrived here. He then explained that he adapted quickly thanks to the stories Nathan used to tell him. As they went inside, Nathan asked how J1 recognized him. J1 reminded him that he had drawn a portrait of him before, even though he hadn't fully believed it at the time. J1 cupped Nathan's face, smiled, and said, I really can't take my eyes off you. Nathan smiled back and said, I told you. Suddenly, J1's smile faded, and he flicked Nathan's forehead. Nathan, wincing in pain, asked why. J1 asked, Did you eat some of the honey cookies Ji Huan gave you to give me? Nathan smiled sheepishly and replied, I couldn't resist it. They looked tasty. J1 looked like he was about to flick his forehead again, but when Nathan shut his eyes tightly, J1 pulled him into a kiss. Nathan opened his eyes briefly and kissed back.